Hi there, Matt Easton, Scholar Gladiatoria. So, um, I often get asked questions about things which are on the wall behind me here, and obviously I talk about all sorts of things. Oh, and one little thing I'll just mention before I get into this video is, um, I'm aware of the fact that I've done a lot of videos in the last few weeks, um, standing here in front of this wall, and it can get a bit monotonous and a little bit boring for, for the viewers. Um, I will start doing videos in the class, outside, different places again soon, um, but as you guys know, or my regular viewers know at least, I've had a stinky flu recently um, and I'm just just about recovered from it now um, so hopefully I'll start to get outside and do a little bit more again soon but there are two things on my wall that get questioned a fair number of times and that is what is that thing just above my head um, and questions about these Kolishmad small swords now I'm going to talk about small swords very briefly and only one aspect of them today um, but just briefly because people keep asking, that is a Burmese dart and it will feature in an upcoming video. Um, but I'm going to talk more about that, as I say, in a future video, not in this one. Right, so Kolishmad small swords, what are they? Well, this is the first one I got and um, this actually came to me um, from an auction lot. As, as you guys know, I, I, I buy and sell um, antiques and this came to me with a bunch of things. Uh, and initially I just thought, oh well, be, you know, that'll sell well. And then I got it in hand and I thought, oh, I quite like this, I think I'll keep it. Um, now, I am actually intending now probably to sell this, now that I've got another one. Um, however, it was such an interesting thing in my hand that I decided to keep it. Um, because obviously one of the reasons I like to own lots of swords is so that I can study swords, learn more about swords, be able to explain more about different types of swords and how they developed and how they relate to each other. And the Kolishmad small sword is actually a very I iconic and relatively, I suppose in a way, important sword, in, certainly in, in European sword development. First of all, it's a small sword. What is a small sword? Well, small swords ultimately developed out of rapiers. So if we look at the late 17th century, there was a tendency, and this is not universal, but there was a tendency for rapiers to, to in the later 17th century, to get somewhat shorter and somewhat lighter. Um, there are various reasons for this, and this would warrant a video all by itself. Um, some people would argue it's because they were becoming more dress items, some people would argue it's more because they were becoming specialised to the duel and weren't used so much as um, sort of officers or battlefield sidearms anymore. Um, these are all valid reasons and, and all uh, potentially true in their different ways. I think, like many things, there were probably lots of different influences that led to that development. In certain places, for example in Spain, they did retain the use of earlier styles of, of rapiers <coughs> until later into the 18th century. So there were places where big rapiers, and bear in mind a rapier is very different to a small sword, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but there were places where old style rapiers were kept in use alongside, and in fact against small swords. And there are some early small sword and late rapier texts that actually talk about the, when I say texts, I mean treatises, manuals, that talk about these opposed to each other. In other words, if you're using a small sword against rapier, how should you fence? If you're fencing a rapier against a small sword, how should you fence? And obviously different people th thought that they ha one had the advantage over the other, and there was some debate about this. My impression, based on I, what my own fencing and witnessing other people who are experienced at both rapier and experienced at small sword fencing each other, is I think generally speaking rapiers have an advantage over small swords because they're longer, essentially. Um, they, um, they have such a reach advantage, it's very difficult, as I've spoken about in many videos before, whether you're fighting knife versus sword or sword versus spear or uh, saber versus rapier, whatever, if one weapon is much longer than the other, that is a significant problem to overcome unless there are shields or armour involved. If we take shields and armour out of the equation, then generally speaking the person with the longer weapon has a natural advantage unless there is something inherently more offensive about the shorter weapon. For example, and this is an argument I made in Sword vs. Quarterstaff, which, um, which provoked lots of response videos uh, from various people showing, saying, ah, the Quarterstaff's awesome. And yes, the Quarterstaff is awesome, although not as awesome as a Quarterstaff with a metal thing on the end, like a bill or a partisan or a spear, um, clearly. Um, but the point I was trying to make was, 
that a quarterstaff, whilst it is a very offensive stick, is just a stick. A sword is sharp and pointed, and therefore any single hit with any single hit, a large percentage of the hits from a sword could disable or kill you, whereas a large percentage of the hits from a stick won't kill you, they'll hurt you, and they'll bruise you, or at worst break your bones or give you concussion, but um, edged weapons are very dangerous by the very fact that they are edged and pointed. So, getting back to the point, that was a large rambling tangent there. Um, small swords essentially came about in the late 17th century, and um, they were an adaptation of the late rapier, and the reason they're called small sword, importantly to note, is because they're smaller than a rapier. They're not particularly small, um, they are quite light. Um, you could also say that they were called small swords to differentiate them from the broadsword, which at the time meant the cut and thrust sword, which is <coughs> heavier and of course broader. So they're small in width compared to a broadsword, but they're also small in length compared to a rapier. Now this is what the modern fencing foil, when I say modern fencing foil, I mean the fencing foil still in use, but the fencing foil that we know today has been more or less around since, <coughs> since the mid, um, no, early 18th century. You could even say the late 17th century. There were earlier forms of foil which were more closely um, analogues to rapiers of the day, so there were earlier 17th century foils, but they are rapier sized, they're big and long and heavy. Um, the small sword, however, tends to weigh as little as 500 grams. It's very, 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 very light weapon. And they tend to have blades of anywhere between 28 and 32 inches. You can do the centimetres conversion yourselves. Um, so they're relatively short compared to a rapier, but they're about the same length as a sabre. Um, but very clearly they're a lot narrower than a sabre or a broadsword and whilst some early ones have some cutting capacity a lot of them like this are triangular section and have no cutting capacity whatsoever. This is a real antique um, uh, small sword and it has the edge comes to a fine edge it hasn't been sharpened could you sharpen it? You could possibly make it a bit sharper but it comes to a fine narrow edge but it is triangular section. Okay, if we look at the base of the blade here, you'll see that it has a ridge on one side and a hollow on the other. It is called hollow ground. That means that it is like, um, if you imagine a, a triangle, but then each of the planes, you grind them inwards. Okay, so it's almost like a star, three-pointed star in cross section. And that, of course, means it's extremely rigid and um, extremely light for the rigidity that you have and the size that you have. It's a bit like <coughs> a structural I-beam or H-girder depending on what you call it. Um, so it's a very very stiff blade, I can flex it, but it's very very stiff for the weight and it cannot, that hurts a bit, ow, that hurts quite a bit, but very clearly you're not going to be able to chop anyone's Ow! <laughs> You're not going to be able to chop anyone's arm off. You can really whip someone really nastily with one of these, but they are in no way a cutting weapon. And that does, of course, mean you can grab them quite easily and quite securely. Um, no problem at all to grab that. I'm pulling quite hard from both ends, okay? So they are really a, a light and nimble spike, and they are only good for thrusting. But they are very good at that. Because they're shorter, um, you do have a pretty good um, sort of leverage or bind, strength of bind, against a longer weapon <coughs> like a rapier. Because um, against the longer weapon, it essentially means that your fort is increased and their foible is increased. So strong against weak in the bind, it's easier for you to get a strong bind against the rapier. But they, <coughs> they have such a reach advantage against you that they can disengage and thrust somewhere else. But really, if you're fencing, from my point of view, if you're fencing small sword against rapier, you want to be seeking that bind and closing distance. It's a little bit like fighting sword versus spear, I believe. Some people may disagree, but my view is if you've got a single small sword against a single rapier, you want to bind and close distance as quickly as possible. And clearly, at close distance, this is easier to get into little spaces, and especially if you're grappling distance, this is more useful, really, than a rapier is in general. The only way that a rapier has an advantage in close, uh, or the only advantage in close that a rapier has over a small sword, 
perhaps is the more substantial hilt and a rapier hilt is more able to um, give blows and things like this. A small sword hilt, because it's got a very light blade, it has to have a very light hilt and so it's quite small and dainty and not very good for hitting people with. So you can't really end people rightly with this pommel. Um, the finger rings, they descend from the rapier but by and large in small sword use they're not used as finger rings. I could physically fit my finger through there, but that's not usually how small swords are shown being held in the treatises. Instead, it's usually held with the lowest three fingers down at the bottom of the grip and the index finger laid over one of the rings to help steer and direct the point and the thumb extending up the side or back of the grip here. Okay, so the hand is in this kind of position with the finger and the thumb pointing forwards. And that gives you a very extended and very nimble um, control of the point with, a very, uh, with the blade in line with the forearm. So it's almost like a pistol grip. Now, the point I really wanted to make in this video, um, having given just a very brief overview of small swords and what they are, <laughs> is the Kolishmad. So what is a Kolishmad small sword? Well, with this one you can see it has a narrow blade and then it suddenly goes wide. And as mentioned, the section of the blade stays the same. It's triangular and hollow ground. Now, I'll just grab... <coughs> Please excuse my cough. As mentioned, I'm recovering from flu, so um, I'm doing my best here. Um, this example is similar to the other one. It's a bit longer, and um, it's not quite as broad at the Kolishmard section. And it's a hell of a lot more ornate. Let's try and get that in focus. There we go. At the hilt. You see, it's incredibly detailed. Even the knuckle bow has decoration on it. Silver and copper wire on the grip. Um, decorated. There we go. Decorated pommel. Absolutely gorgeous decoration on this thing. And you can see even the blade has decoration on it on both sides. Now this the, the reason I'm probably selling the other one is because I only need one nice small sword in my life and this one's a bit more fancy than the other one so I'm probably going to keep this one and sell the other one. Um, but this um, is nevertheless also a Kolishman. So a Kolishman small sword is defined by having that wide base. Now I'll probably talk a little bit more about the origin of the Kolishmard and its purpose and all of that kind of thing. But general consensus of opinion is that this was an adaptation to enable more effective defence against things like sabres, okay, or backswords or broadswords. Now, this is the point I, I want, really want to get to. Do I think that that's the case? I'm not sure. Common opinion, because these are often associated with more military use small swords, and by that I mean officers' weapons, obviously not carried by the rank and file, um, but carried as officers serving as soldiers, rather than the civilian small swords, which tend to not have, and this isn't always the case, they certainly you do get college mods which were for civilian use, this is probably for civilian use, um, although it does have, I don't know, don't know whether it is or not. Um, but one of the perceptions is that this broad base is to oppose heavier cutting weapons like backswords and broadswords and sabres and hangers and things like this and cutlasses. Um, whereas the ones which continue at this thickness up here, continue in a straight line to the hilt, are more dueling weapons. Now I'm not really convinced that that's true um, for a number of reasons. Firstly, I think if this broad section was for defending against things like broadswords and backswords, why would it still be edged? And why would it still be that section? Um, I personally would look for a blunter, thicker, heavier section to the blade here if I was looking to defend against heavy cutting swords. Um, I wouldn't still have it with a really fine edge and hollow ground and still really very light. Doesn't seem to make an awful lot of sense to me. But more importantly than that, small swords, as far as I've seen, practically always have incredibly narrow tangs, comparable with a modern fencing foil. Now, I just so happen to have fought sabre and backsword against small sworders in competition and friendly sparring, 
And I have broken and bent a number of small sworders blades. And one of the places that they go is, like many swords, at the junction between the blade and the tang. Now traditionally, modern blades are made of one piece of steel and the tang is cut thinner and that's the portion that you put the hilt on. Traditionally, the tang was a separate piece of metal, usually made of iron, um, and that was forge welded to a steel blade up until quite late in the 19th century. So at the time when these 18th century, and this probably dates to about 1720, 1750, at the time that these were made, this blade is made of high carbon steel, but the tang is made of iron. Now iron is softer and it's less likely to break, but it's more likely to bend. That's good for shock absorbency, but it does mean um, that any heavy blows coming onto the blade, and we agree that if you are defending against heavy blows, the best place to receive, the, receive them is the base of the blade, very clearly, because that's known as the fort or the strong, and it's the place that you can most actively and effectively actually parry is the base of the blade. But if you're doing that, I think that the tangs on these are still too insubstantial to take much force, to take much of a blow. If I took this cavalry sabre and swung it full force at a small sworder's head, and they couldn't get out of the way and they were obliged to defend their head, I think that I would stand a very good chance of either breaking through this blade or severely damaging it in some way, and possibly at the same time, breaking or bending the join between the tang and the blade. <laughs> so while I think that this broader section would make them slightly better for defending against weapons like sabres and backswords, I think that the tangs are still too insubstantial for it. If we look at a spadroon, for example, so a spadroon, which obviously you all know I love spadroons, um, <laughs> I don't, um, they are genuinely militarised small swords. Okay, so what they've essentially done with the spadroon is they've taken a blade and they've given it some cutting capacity, a bollocks cutting capacity, it has to be said, usually, but they're still usually reasonably good thrusters, except for the bad ones, like the British 1796 Spadroon, which is a bad thruster and a bad cutter. But if we look at some French examples, for example, they are good thrusting swords still, but they're much more substantial in the hilt and the tang, and that's very important if you're going to be defending against sabres and backswords. So all in all, I'm not really convinced that Collishmards are an adaptation to be better at defending against cutting swords. Because I think the first thing you would change to make a small sword better for defending against cutting swords isn't the base of the blade necessarily, and if you did I don't think that you would make it like this. I think the first thing you'd want to change is the tang and give it a far more substantial tang. So I have come to wonder if this flared base of the blade is for some other reason. Perhaps something to do with the way that the bind is formed against an opponent's blade, perhaps giving a broader um, seat or shoulder for the hilt to sit against. Um, I don't really know. Um, the jury's still out and feel free to post your ideas and suggestions underneath this video because I'd be really <coughs> interested to hear um, your views on this. But I personally just don't think that a Collishmard small sword is very well adapted to dealing with blows from broadswords and backswords and sabres. Um, and I think really you would want to be focusing on the hilt and the tang if you wanted to make this a more effective weapon for doing that. Anyway, I hope this has been a mildly interesting video. I apologise again for my chest. I'm trying to soldier through and uh, more videos will be coming soon, including about the mysterious Burmese Dar. Cheers, folks. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, follow us on Facebook. You can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.